Anyways. And we're recording. Welcome to episode number two of the Okanagan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Raina, your local South Okanagan realtor coming to you from Penticton. And I am Marika, and I'm all the way in Kelowna, um, serving the Okanagan, West Kelowna, Kelowna, and Lake Country. And today we have a very, very special guest, the lovely Chad, Chad Winter. Winter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just a guy bored at his office, hanging out with a couple of really nice ladies in real estate. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on today. So Chad is a mortgage broker with Ziba and he loves to service our clients. He's amazing. And we thought we would um, have a good conversation with Chad about finances and the mortgage process. Isn't that right? I'm happy to be here, ladies. Thanks for bringing me on. So, actually, so how was your week so far? Uh, it's been pretty busy. I uh, actually just hired an assistant. So this was her first week on the job. So that's uh, exciting for me because now I don't have to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> which, is, assistant now. which is great. But now I have to train her. But that's all. But hey, it's so good. I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. That's but, awesome. So I, not- I wanted to talk about something. Um, Chad, you know, when we were trying to start the podcast, we did some research and, you know, we found something from 2000, what was it, 17, I think? I think it was 2017, or late 16, early 17, I think is what I it was. I wish I had the image saved, but I got a new mm. phone and somehow deleted it. But anyways, Chad actually had the first Okanagan Real Estate Podcast, didn't you? I had something of that nature, yes. And I went to search for it and could not find it. So I don't know where it disappeared to. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what happened to that, hey? <laughs> you can still, you can probably still find it if you search I love Kelowna real estate. Okay, so you know what? After we get off here, we're going to have to do some searching and listen to all the advice Chad had back in the day. Absolutely. The market was a little bit different back then, hey? It was a lot different, yes. Yeah. So was your podcast similar to ours, like more of a conversation and bringing people on? Um, yeah, I mean, my podcast was all about just like talking to anyone in the real estate world. Um, it kind of stemmed from my old business partner, who was the one that kind of ran it. So he had this thing called I Love Clone Real Estate. And he was just kind of didn't want to do it anymore. So I said, well, I'll take it on. That's fine. And it was great because I just had anybody that was really anything in real estate, whether it was realtors, lawyers, um, we always pick kind of a topic. So obviously every realtor likes to market themselves as something, or I'm the first time home buyer specialist or I'm whatever. Um, so we just kind of kept it relevant to what they like to market themselves as like one would talk about first time home buyers. One would talk about selling properties. One would talk about working with buyers. Um, but then I also interviewed like people in like anything to do with real estate, like you electricians and, um, inspectors and everything like appraisers. I talked to city councilors about the whole property taxes because it was funny. You property taxes come out and everyone's like, what's going on with property taxes? Why is mine so much and yours is so low and blah, blah. And people don't understand it. So I reached out to one of the city councilors and said, Hey, we have this issue. How about you come and talk about it? He's like done. So we did one on like how taxes are calculated with the city of Kelowna and it was just everything around real estate and like Kelowna, like in general, right? So, well, but it was you know great. What? Yeah. Thanks for all the ideas because that's yeah. exactly what we wanted. I was right? writing those down, so hopefully you don't yeah, mind. Exactly. If I <laughs> Fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so awesome. Well, you know, how was your guys' week, Raina? How was it's your- always worth it, ladies. It's always worth it. <laughs> <laughs> My week was good. I have to say I did take a little bit of a break. Um, Me and my husband's honeymoon to Spain was actually canceled earlier this year due to COVID and travel restrictions. So we were hoping things would open back up again, but unfortunately they didn't. But instead, we booked a few days at a getaway at Sparkling Hill in Vernon. And I'll tell you, it's amazing what we have in our own backyard. Um, The pools were fantastic, popped some champagne, had some really good food. And yeah, it was a nice little makeup. Can I tell you a little story about Sparkling Hills? Please do. (laughs) Have you ever watched the show Millionaire Matchmaker? Yes. Yes. So the show Millionaire Matchmaker, I may or may not have been watching it over my wife's shoulder while she was watching it. I thought you were going to say you were on it. (laughs) No. (laughs) One of the guys who actually was on Millionaire Matchmaker took his date 
two sparkling hills as their like getaway date for a million on the actual show really millionaire matchmaker yeah you know what yeah. actually um yeah. it was also on the oh i think it was vancouver housewives the vancouver's housewives show probably oh that yeah. makes sense they did a big they went to sparkling hill yeah i remember yeah. that I think so, so the date sure. the date was going in that like silly like negative whatever sauna thing like that was the oh, date that they showed when they I put on the masks and the cryo one yeah whatever yeah. it was yeah oh, wow. that was the date he took his date in there on the millionaire matchmaker that's what that's they did not bad. i've done that twice now and it was every time i go it's just this invigorating like it's good you know, it's just so correct. relaxing Crystals is that why you everywhere. look so youthful marika that's exactly what, and, you know good lighting folks <laughs> rain has been in it at least 50 times that's why she looks so young i know well, she's the bombshell right i don't know if you can see our intro but we've got rain as the bombshell oh <laughs> my god <laughs> we, we were joking around about that i'm not sure how it made its way into the beginning of each episode's podcast but <laughs> i love it i think it's got uh character <laughs> better better um, than the better than the guy on the bachelorette calling her a smoke show <laughs> that show do you so think? i've heard so i've heard i don't know I, I saw it on i saw it on facebook somewhere <laughs> well okay, chad what? and i actually go way back we were just chatting um it's been over a decade that we actually used to work together but we both used to work at bridge park earls in burnaby yep wow. yep <laughs> we, we've come a long way hey chad we, we have come a long way yes <laughs> now you're doing both doing girls yeah. in the okanagan she she was my she was my uncooperative lounge server and I was the uh, night manager trying to keep her in line. Yeah, <laughs> the night manager. <laughs> oh boy! Oh, Charlie. some good times. <laughs> okay, well let's let's move our. Let's um, get into it. Let's get into some conversations about real estate. So, um, I'm actually right now waiting for a closing. So I've had a few this week. I think what's going on now is. Um, well, actually, you know, I wanted to talk about what's going on today. So I have a closing today. I thought it was going to happen earlier. And next thing you know, I get an email from the other agent stating that there needs to be some, some signatures happening on some paperwork from the lawyers. And I'm like, oh, okay. I, I thought by now we'd have keys to the place. So it's 2.30 and I'm kind of on um, standby waiting for this to happen. I really hope it happens by five o'clock. The life That's of a realtor. Not, <laughs> not, you know, just the perfect example of the life of a realtor. And a mortgage broker always down to, you know, five o'clock day uh, yeah. to get stuff done. So that's kind of my day. Um, not too stressful, but it is what it is. Um, did you want to pop into some stats for the week and what's going on in real estate? I do. But first, I think we should put out our exciting annou announcement that the Live Group and South Okanagan Living are hosting our 12 days of giving. Yeah. And chat's going to be part of that too. So I'm super excited about it. We got the idea from our friends over at Sims Real Estate in Nanaimo. Um, and basically, we're giving away a bunch of free stuff. We're promoting our sponsors and our local businesses. And we just want to make some people happy. And I'm yeah, happy to be voluntold to donate something. <laughs> We've got some amazing local Okanagan businesses that have donated some incredible prizes. I know we've got Bellevue Day Spa. We have, I think we might have a TV coming. Uh, we've got yeah. an unlimited month to oxygen yoga and uh, so many gift cards like available for everyone. Yeah, I don't so mean to be that. I don't. Mean, I don't mean to be that guy. But is yoga right now with yesterday's announcement really <laughs> what we should have? Or I'm just. But anyways. <laughs> you know, it's good for whenever they're able to use it. <laughs> You know what they do actually on uh, they when I go to that studio and they shifted everything to online and they oh, offer live good. streaming and last time I went they allowed what five or six people in but yeah anyways I guess the announcements the announcement yesterday is going to definitely have an effect on what's going to happen in the future so you know before we talk about stats Chad what do you think about that what do you think is going to happen um what do you think about COVID and and mortgages right now um, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'm just gonna go over here. And, uh... <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, co COVID has not done anything to the mortgage world. Um, I know at first, like when March hit and everyone was kind of on lockdown at first, it was a real kind of big pain point with a lot of brokers and people because obviously you have all these like banks that worked in a big like 
downtown Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, kind of like center. And then they all had to disperse home. Um, so most of them, I, and the, the biggest pain point back then was how do these people operate at their full capacity when they go from an office where they have everything to home where they got all these distractions. Um, and reality is in our world, like everything we do is remote. So it's like, I mean, the, the technology and the innovation in the mortgage world has gotten a million times better this year with COVID. It hasn't gotten worse. So like we have technology now in our world that we've never had before. Like, which is amazing because in the whole speed efficiency and how we interact and act with clients, it's completely different because before COVID, I would meet 95% of my clients. And now I don't meet any of them because I'm like not allowed to. So I'm like, how does that work? Mm -hmm. So we just, we use different tools. We use different things. And in some aspects, it's actually helped me because if you know me, I like to talk and a 30 minute meeting in an office could turn into an hour and a half meeting. But I'm, I mean, it's now to the point it's direct and here's your information. And it's actually been streamlined a lot, but also, I mean, rates are and everything are just as like all time low. And I don't think it's changing anytime soon. So, so I guess, um, you know, you're more efficient because you don't have to actually leave anywhere and you save that walking time to get to the coffee shop to meet your clients. <laughs> Uh, what coffee shop? My wife's, my wife's not listening. Is she, there is no coffee shop. <laughs> and zoom just cuts you off right at the 45 minute mark. So you don't even have to yeah. say goodbye. Well, that's if you're too cheap to pay for the full version. Come on. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling this one's going to go over time. <laughs> uh -huh. I'll, I'll send you my link. <laughs> <Big deal. laughs> no, I got the full version guys. It's all good. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk. Uh, let's do Kelowna stats. I'm just going to do a quick sold. We had 120 sell this week. It's actually up from last week. I think people are kind of finalizing things before Christmas. In terms of listed, we've got 102. Last week it was 86. So those are up too. What's going to happen next week? I think it's going to be a little bit similar. Um, you know, I always say December, January, February. I'm usually quite busy. And I think, you know, in Kelowna, realtors do notice that we still keep going. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see kind of the week before Christmas, what um, the sales and the, and the listings are. But for now, I think we're going to hang tight and continue on the same trend here. What about you, right? I'll jump into Penticton, Penticton's numbers. So single family homes are sitting at an average of 697,000 right now with average days on market at 65. Um, I think the good news for buyers is that we're still seeing new inventory coming to market every week. So as long as we don't see supply drop, we're still in a good place. Um, for townhouses and multifamily homes, the average price is sitting at about 432,000. 432, yeah, days to sell is um, 95, which is increasing from earlier in the year. And we have about five and a half months of inventory on the market right now, which presently is in a balanced market. Um, and for condos, they are sitting at about 302,000. Um, average days on market are 103 and we have over nine months supply on the market right now. So as we mentioned last week, if you're a buyer or an investor, the condo market is absolutely your biggest opportunity right now in South Okanagan. That's awesome, fantastic, okay. So since our topic of the day is Chad Winnegar and finances, why don't we start talking about the importance of um, getting your ducks in a row before you, you know, start shopping around for a house. I think oftentimes people start, start the, the other way around and they approach a realtor and they start looking for properties when they're not pre-approved and, you know, they end up wasting a lot of time or being disappointed. Um, so maybe we can talk about the pre-approval process a little bit, Chad, and how does that work with, um, you and your clients? Um, yeah, I mean, ultimately a pre-approval. So there's a big common misconception in our world versus what a pre-approval is and what a rate hold is. Um, and the biggest thing, like I try and get across to people is that when they go to their bank and their bank says they got a rate hold, that is not a pre-approval. Um, Ultimately, at the end of the day, like a pre-approval, if you are somebody who has heard from your bank that you are pre-approved, but you have not provided them any documentation whatsoever as far as tax returns, notice of assessments, T4s, job letters, pay stubs, any of that stuff, I can tell you 100%, you are not pre-approved. Um, 
and and really a pre-approval in my like and this is my opinion um it really it is based on the person you're working with and really what their experience is um and i say that because banks actually when you we send a file to a bank nine out of ten times they actually don't look at anything it's like an auto they don't look at anything no they don't look okay. at documentation um, if you're one of those people who's putting less than 20% down and you need to go to the insurance companies, CMHC, Genworth, which is now called Sagen. Don't ask me why they changed their name. I think it's weird. When did that happen? It was like a few, like a month ago. I don't know. It was really weird. I don't know why a com- I don't know why a company who's been around for many, many years and has a really good name would just all of a sudden change their name. It didn't make any sense to me, but anyway, I'm not there, whatever. <laughs> so it's called Sagen now. It's not Genworth, it's Sagen and then Canada Guarantee they actually will not look at a file unless it's what they call as a live deal. Right. So a approval right. where you don't have a purchase contract and you're just trying to find out numbers, they don't even look at it. So a pre-approval is really only as good as the person who you're working with for them to look at it and really their expertise and like how long they've been in the industry, how many applications they do, and their ability to mitigate what's happening on that application. Um, and so if you haven't sent any information in, you're not pre-approved. You have a rate hold, but a rate hold doesn't exactly tell you that you qualify for the $500,000 that you talked about because they haven't done anything yet. You know, I appreciate you saying that. And it really depends on um, the person or the broker because, you know, a couple, about a month ago, I got into a situation where we had, the market was hot. The price range for this place was under 400,000 and we had multiple offers. I think we got up to seven um of offers that collapsed and you know we got to the point where we were asking for pre-approval letters from all these people so here we are in a situation we've got three offers coming and i said well listen my clients are not going to look at it unless you get a pre-approval well guess what none of them could get a pre-approval letter for us they you know what i mean like why not like this should be something that if I'm, if my clients are working with Chad, for instance, and I need a pre-approval letter, like Chad's their broker, he should be able to get me that letter, you know, in an instant, right? So I often wonder, like, why can't they get the pre-approval? Maybe they weren't really pre-approved, right? And that, From the and buyer's that's... perspective, they might be shopping for something that's way over their budget, and they're not going to find out into the until they're losing out on that property. Totally. S- So it was about, I remember this because I just laughed, but it was about, well, 12 years ago now, because I've been, I've been a broker for 15 years. um, And 12 years ago, I remember I had this customer, this is really funny. I had this customer that came, that was referred to the office that I was working in. And um, he comes in and we're doing the whole pre-approval thing. We're taking his application. We're doing his credit checks. We're trying to vet his documentation, all this kind of stuff but he doesn't really have anything to give us. And I'm like, well, what do you do for work? And he was like a janitor or something. And he moved here from Alberta. And, but he literally had just started his job like two months prior as his own like personal contractor. So he was basically self-employed. Yeah. Well, anybody in the mortgage world knows if you're self-employed, you have to have a certain number of years history before you can even use it as income. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if you started your job. Yeah, two-year history for people that don't know that. If you just started your job last month, the bank doesn't care if you made $50,000 in your first month. If you can't prove it for a two-year stretch, they're not going to look at you. Like, that's just the way it is. Yeah. And this guy started his job. His credit score was definitely south of the 600 range. <laughs> So not good. (laughs) Not good. And I was like, man, this is crazy. So like, I kind of was like, I called the realtor who he was working with, who referred us to the office. And I was just like, like, what kind of price point are you taking this guy in? And he's like, oh, he's like, man, we have looked at everything from like Winfield to West Kelowna to down the lake. He's like, we've looked at $500,000 houses and $1.2 million homes on the lake. And I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, and he was just like, no and i'm like and i was like i honestly like i didn't really know what else to say other than like hey you might want to not take this guy out anymore because i'm calling you to tell you he can't even buy a fifty thousand dollar mobile home so (laughs) can i say something like said this to me before (laughs) i remember a conversation i hope no clients are hearing this (laughs) lots of people we come across lots of people right and Chad was like, well, you know, 
you, you better, have you been taking them out? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm waiting. It's like, good, <laughs> you know? So I would appreciate that too. If you have, also, if you have a good relationship with your broker um, to be able to just give you that little bit of extra hint or advice, right? We're not, we're not giving away personal information. We're just no. telling you like, hey, if you I want to do want your to highest and best use activity, this may not be it. <laughs> well, yeah. it's like you want to help them as well, right? Like you want to be steering them in the right direction of something that yeah. they can actually afford and 100%. not aiming for that $3 million house that's on the hill with the view when what they can afford is something that's well, 300000 Nobody's doing anyone any favors by shopping for something you can't afford. Like, because no. all that happens, and I've seen it time and time again, like I was an in-house broker at an a, an office here in town for four years. So like I dealt with like lots of this all the time, but it's like you, like a client looking at houses that they get their hopes set on. And then all of a sudden you, nobody can make it work. The only one that looks bad at the end of the day is the broker and the realtor, because we didn't guide them. Like that's yeah, the number one exactly. thing. Like we always used to have a saying in our office. It's like, we're the bus drivers. We're the ones that control this process. We're the ones that do it every day, all day. We cannot let the clients dictate it because they do it once every five years. If that. Like, exactly. so you got to make sure you walk them down that path and show them the way because they don't do it all day. And, and, and anytime I look at deals that I've worked on that have gone sideways, or maybe it didn't go as planned, it's not because the client did something that they shouldn't have. It's because I let them dictate something. I veered off my path, my plan. And then I just said, oh, we'll see, if we can make it work. When I knew in my head, I couldn't make it work. I was just trying to appease them. Mm -hmm, but like, sure. if, you, if you stick to it and you say, here's how it is, they respect you more for it. But ultimately at the end of the day, you're creating a better client experience for them. Absolutely. Like, yeah. And maybe you can explain to us a little bit about what the difference is for your average consumer, either they're going to their local bank to get pre-approved or working with a mortgage broker. What does that look like? Yeah. I mean, honestly, a mortgage broker, I mean, I, I don't knock banks or anything. I mean, it's just, we, we work for customers, right? Like I have a license that allows me to lend out multiple different banks money. We have major banks that you drive down the road and see to local credit unions, to lenders you probably would have never heard before, but they are just as big, just as reputable as any major bank out there. And what I always tell people, the majority of the money they actually get comes from major banks. <laughs> so um, we just have the ability to look around, obviously. Um, and I mean, if I'm being honest, a mortgage product from a, like you can go to a TD mortgage specialist, or you can come and talk to me and I can send your mortgage application to TD bank. Like the product at the end of the day is going to be the exact same. It's just, who are you dealing with to get you from point A to point B in the quickest, most efficient way possible. And the reality of it is, like I mentioned earlier, the broker world has got all this new tech and innovation in the world that banks don't want to touch because it's third party systems that they don't want to contract out. Right. So like I have the ability to collect your tax documents with a simple consent form. I have the ability to like get your bank statements without you having to go to the bank or log into on your, or into your own online banking. Like just things like that, that just make it so much simpler where like you can go to a bank and get, they can give you a list this long of documentation, or you can come to me and I can give you a list this long of documentation. Same stuff, just a different way of retrieving it. So, would you say that the banks have more like black and white lending criteria that they follow? Not at all. No, actually, they complicate things even more. Yeah, they're very, um, that's my opinion. But because you got to remember again, the person you deal with at the bank is they're only as good as how much experience they have. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm not knocking banks. But a bank, if you are a really, really, really good bank employee, you're not sitting in that desk dealing with a credit application from customers for too long. The bank's like, this person's a rock star. How do we push them up the ladder? And they keep moving them along. So a lot of times someone would walk into the bank and they're dealing with the newest, greenest person who, I mean, I think about my bank experience and man, I was assuming a mortgage once that was like a, a Scotiabank mortgage. And I remember sitting there in the bank across the desk from somebody. Keep in mind, I've been a broker at this point for like five years now. <laughs> and I've done piles and piles of mortgages with Scotiabank. And I was literally sitting there with my wife going through this application because we were just assuming a mortgage, like from my parents. They didn't want, they were trying to sell it. And anyways, but we were assuming this mortgage. 
And the guy was literally, he had this piece of paper that was sitting there on his desk. And it was funny because I was looking at the piece of paper and I was watching him and he was asking me questions and he was looking down at this piece of paper and asking me questions. And all it was, was it was actually his lending matrix sheet that even me as a mortgage broker can go and print off of a PDF, which had <laughs> Scotiabank's lending criteria on it. Like that's how green he was. He had to physically have it in front of him to look at. And he's asking me all these questions and I'm just like, oh my goodness. And the thing that made me laugh the most was the fact that the one question he never asked me was what do you do for work? <laughs> And I'm oh, sitting here as a mortgage broker who literally, that mortgage was in my parents' name because I was the broker who placed it there. <laughs> and now I'm trying to assume it, but I got to go talk to the bank to assume it. And the guy's like, uh, and he's asking, and I'm just like, and then he had to walk out of the room to like go ask his manager a question. And I remember turning to my wife and being like, can I just help him please? And she's like, no, keep your mouth shut. I'm like, no, please just let me help him. Like, and I got to the point where I'm just like, dude, I'm sorry. Like, I'm a mortgage broker. I'm the one, like, if you do this, 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 put that number there, put that number there, put this here, 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 and here, the deal should work. And he was kind of like, uh, and I'm like, just do that and then move on. And it was like, it was funny. <laughs> I guess what we can say is basically it's the experience, the client. 100%. Right? Because 100%. You know, you know, people work with us for certain reasons. There's yeah. a reason why we send our clients to Chad because they get it experience and we know he's going to get stuff done right the chat experience the chat <laughs> we're going to yeah. market that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, you know we work all the time we're available i get texts you know after five and at the bank your your broker from the bank is not going to answer you're probably not even going to even know their cell number nothing they're no. probably not even open on sunday <laughs> I tell, I tell my clients all the time. I'm like, if you are cannot sleep at night and you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and you have mortgage questions burning, like, and that's why you can't sleep by all means, call my cell phone and rant on my voicemail. I'm like, my, my phone's on, do not disturb. It will not ring, but you'll still get my voice and you can still leave a message. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know what, the experience is what people are after. And yeah. that's what we offer all of our clients. Right. Yeah. yeah. So Chad, I have another question for you. With interest rates right now as low as they are, would you recommend someone going with a fixed or variable mortgage right now? That is the number one question. And the best answer I can provide is uh, it all depends on the client. It, and it really honestly does. Like me as a mortgage broker, like because I'm in the industry and I understand it, like I would, I would take a variable all day long. But it all really depends on... The number one question I ask people is like, are you medium risk? High? And it's kind of the financial planning question. Are you mm -hmm. medium risk, low risk, or a high risk person? Like, what kind of investor are you? And if they're like, oh, I'm very low risk, I'm like, then don't take a variable. But I mean, at the end of the day, like the variable rate has always really kind of come out ahead when you compare it with a five-year fixed. Um, and it really just depends because most people don't like the fluctuation in payments. But at the end of the day, the payment fluctuation is not that great. Like variable rates only increase by 0.25% increments at a time. Like that's pretty much what's been standard over the last, like since I've been a broker 15 years. Yeah. Everyone's risk is like, well, what happens if the variable jumps like a percentage point or two percentage points overnight? I'm like, it'll never happen. Yeah. Like the government does not allow that. Like, so the most it's ever increased or decreased is by 0.25 of a percent. Yes, in a year stretch, it's gone up by a percentage point, but at any time when you, and the Bank of Canada has a list of all their meeting dates and when they do their announcements and whenever it happens. So you can plug it into your calendar and you know exactly when the, when the announcements are gonna come out. Mm -hmm. But the beauty thing about a variable is even if you are kind of in that point where you're just like, I don't want this anymore. Like it's like, you're literally getting wigged out about it. You can't sleep, you're stressing and all that. You can always lock, Every single variable rate mortgage has a clause where you can lock it in at any time without penalty. So you can always fix it whenever you want. So whether that's a year down the road, three years down the road, three months into your mortgage, you can always lock it in. And I that's one of- That's something a lot of people don't realize. No, and don't. when you go with a fixed, you're stuck in that. And usually there's quite high penalties to get out of that. Yep, a lot of times, yep. It just, it depends. I mean, every situation is different. If, and what I always tell people in the conversations I have with them is just around like how long they plan on having this home. 
Like, is this a beginner home where you're going to have it for three years, then you're going to want to move? Because if you're going to want to have it for three years, no, don't take a fixed rate. Because there's one thing I can guarantee you that in three years, you're, you're going to have a payout penalty. So either A, take a variable where you know the penalty is the cheapest it's going to possibly be, which is a three-month interest penalty, or B, take a three-year mortgage rate so that in three years you can pay it out without any penalty. But question. Um, let's say you do get a, a variable rate and after a year you want to lock it in. Would you have to do a five-year term? No, they, they match the remaining term of your mortgage. So okay. if you're, and, that, and that's the question mark you don't actually have. So right. because rates fluctuate just like everything else. So if you're into a, a five-year variable and you're into it for two years, they will lock you in at whatever the three-year rate is at that time. Okay. So it's not like you're guaranteed the rate when you actually got it. It's at the time of lock-in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Awesome. Um, okay. What else do we need to talk about today, guys? We're... You know what? I think one interesting question that maybe some people that oh, and she froze have never had a mortgage before and don't quite understand. Oh, did I freeze? Yeah. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think. I think a question that some maybe first time home buyers or people that have never had a mortgage before, they don't really understand how does a mortgage broker get paid? Is that something that they have to pay for hourly? I think it's just, it might be a misconception that a lot of people have that scares them away from using a mortgage broker and in turn have them going to the bank. Good question. Yep. The good news is, is your realtor will pay for your mortgage broker. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. Um, yeah. So basically like when you look at the lending area, like how we do our lending. So there, if you classify it as A lenders, B lenders, C lenders, and the C category is kind of like private lenders. Mm -hmm. In the A and B categories, we get paid a finder's fee from the bank. So I place you a TD bank. They pay me a, a finder's fee based on the term of the mortgage and the amount of the mortgage. Um, and it doesn't get calculated into the interest rates. It's not like you're paying a higher interest rate because they're paying us. I mean, when you actually look at the fixed credit disclosure statement, which we give you, you notice that the amount of interest paid on the mortgage is X number of dollars. And it could be large, like $100,000 over five years. Really all that's happening is we're just getting a little bit of that. But whether you use us or not, the bank's still getting it. It's kind of the, way, the best way to describe it. So the bank either gets $100,000 or they get $95,000, like take your pick. But we just are able to help clients a little bit better on the other side, just because I know a lot more about their products than like maybe a fresh new person might in the branch. Um, but we can also compare it to other products. So in the A and B categories, we get paid a finder's fee from the actual bank. In the C category or the private lending category, they don't pay us. We physically have to charge a fee, but we're talking like second mortgages, high interest, like all that kind of stuff. If I'm being 100% honest with you, 99.99999% of my business is all in the A lending category. I deal with lots of realtors, financial planners. Uh, I mean, I believe in birds of a feather flock together. So if you do one mortgage for one person who's really well put together, chances are they're going to refer you to their friends who are really well put together. Yeah. I don't do a lot of B lending. And I like, I think I've done like maybe two private mortgages in like the last three years. And it's really just because they really, they needed that private money. Like they didn't fit any banking models. That's true. Actually, yeah. that's good of you to say, because we do have someone that only, we only send them um, people that need credit repair and that need that private lending, but yep. that chat is all good. You know, I, I, I know, and <laughs> I know enough of it to be dangerous and know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I just don't, I just, honestly, I just, I've been, I've been lucky enough that I haven't had to have that. Um, but I think on top of which too, like sometimes like I've done some deals and this is really where it comes down to like how hard your broker is working for you sometimes. I've pushed some deals over on the A side and I've been able yeah. to fight for them and I've been able to ask for exceptions and I've been able to actually ask for favors from people who know, like, and trust me. Yeah. They probably shouldn't have been in the A category. They but probably you know shouldn't have been your private. Trust you. 100%. So, so like, right. it really honestly just depends on who you're talking to. Like I've done deals for people where it's like they were bankrupt and they should have never, but like, we were just like, it's, we were able to fit it into an A box, like just because I fought hard enough for it. And they just finally got to the barn, just like, fine, whatever, Chad, we'll do it. Just go away. Like, 
So it just really depends on your exp on the experience and really how hard people are. Because a lot of times, like there's the cusp where they're kind of teetering on the fence. I would definitely try and push them over to the A side versus going to the private side because I, I personally would. I would hate to pay fees and 12 percent interest. Nobody wants mortgage. private lending if they don't have to. They right. don't. It's no. a band aid fix, is what it yeah. is. But yeah. some people, the band aid stays on way too long. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. But. Well, you know what, Chad? Thank you so much for being on today. We appreciate. Thank you. It so much. Yeah. Thank you. I think you're full of knowledge. So next time we have some burning financial questions, we'll have to have you on again. For sure. Love that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Reina. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll and see we'll see you next week. Next week. Bye. Thank Bye. you.